Psalm 19, we'll begin reading verse 7. I'm just going to use this as a springboard, and we'll come back to it in a few minutes. But verse number 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect. I don't need a new book. I got the inspired, infallible one right in front of me, the God-breathed one, the one that is without error. It's perfect. Hmm? You know why man wants to change his book? Because this book reveals what man is. And it also reveals who God is. Hmm? Uh, and uh, God doesn't worry about being gender-friendly. Fr He's God. Just thought I'd throw that in. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. When he converts a soul, he does it through the washing of the water of the Word of God. No one ever gets saved apart from the Word of God, but it's a work of the Spirit of God that births us into the family of God. And when God does birth someone into the family of God and converts them, he changes them from what they were to what they will be. We were saved out of sin... We were sinners, now we're saints of God. Now that, uh, my little pea brain, that baffles me and boggles me. Uh, there's no uh, uh, stair steps to get to become a saint. Uh, 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 you're either a saint or you ain't. And what makes you a saint is the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, but anyway, I'm not even preaching yet, but it says, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. That's why that educated crowd from Harvard don't like the Bible. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. Anytime you find fear of the Lord in the Old Testament, it's referring to a reverential trust with a hatred of evil. And when you truly fear God, it's because you reverence Him supremely above everything else. You love what He loves, and you hate what He hates. Mm, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord my strength, and my Redeemer. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing. We thank you, Lord, for the good testimonies. But God, we thank you for your presence. Lord, my heart's been made to rejoice. Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to be in your house tonight. Lord, thank you for these that have assembled tonight. And Lord, I pray you'd bless each and every one to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus tonight. May we truly have our eyes enlightened, our hearts stirred, uh, and Lord, our souls motivated to do something for Jesus in these days. Father, I pray in a crowd this size, if there's somebody here tonight unsaved, lost without God, that tonight would be the night of their salvation. But I pray for the saints of God, you'd edify them, and for the sole purpose that we would glorify you. Now, Father, have your will and way amongst us. Use this unworthy vessel. You know my heart, Father. I just want to be a blessing to your people. And so, Father, uh, I pray that you would get glory and honor from this service. Help me tonight say everything you'd have me to say. Help me not say anything contrary to the word or will of God. And God, help uh, folks to receive uh, the word of God with gladness. And help us, Lord, to use it to further the kingdom of God. Lord, we love you. We bless you. For it's in the holy name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen and amen uh, in these verses. And I won't spend a lot of time because I've got a lot to cover tonight. Thad's back there already looking at his watch. Um, in these verses you find uh, riches. The Word of God is a uh, rich thing in the life of the believer. It is the absolute final authority of our lives. 
The judgments of God are rich in the life of the believer. More to be desired are they than gold, and much fine gold sweeter than honey from the honeycomb. So we find riches in these verses. We also find rewards in these verses. Verse 11 says, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. When we uh, uh, heed the warnings of the word of God and the judgments of God, and we keep them, Brother Brian, uh, there is great reward in that. Uh, say, what reward do we have? I'm not talking about uh, when we get to the sweet by and by. I'm talking about peace. Uh, I'm talking about uh, understanding. Uh, I'm talking about a present help in time of need. Uh, I'm talking about there are great rewards in keeping the Bible. Can I say I've known a lot of Christians that... Uh, 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 are uh, weak and they uh, uh, never amount to much for the things of Christ because they have a real problem uh, keeping the Bible. But I've seen some who just uh, put God first, keep the Bible, and they live a blessed and a charmed life. It's not rocket science, friends. When we do what thus saith the Lord, He blesses. His blessing is not contingent on anything we do. His blessing is contingent on that He is God uh, and that He loves us. Uh, and he wants the best for us. Uh, but my dear friends, I've seen those who butt up against God. They do not have the blessings of God in their lives. Uh, thank God for his rewards. There's riches, there's rewards. There's also a rebuke in these verses. Verse 12 starts off with, Who can understand his errors? Friend, outside the word of God, you couldn't. The law was given as our schoolmaster to bring us unto the knowledge of sin. You didn't understand how bad you failed God. Brother Donald, uh, even when you was a good Catholic boy, you didn't realize uh, that you was the enemy of God. You was at enmity with God uh, because every breath you took despised God uh, because you was breaking His law. Hmm? You didn't know that till God revealed it to you through the Word of God through the preaching, the teaching, through somebody uh, uh, sharing the gospel with you, for uh, somebody taking time with you, like he had a friend that took the time with him uh, on the job uh, every day, showing him the scriptures, showing him what God said, uh, investing in him. Uh, aren't you glad for men like Stephen, huh? Yeah. God opens our eyes to truth through his word. But he said there in verse 12, Who can understand his errors? Then the thought changes, Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Uh, let them not have dominion over me. Uh, can I tell you the worst person in this world is somebody who's known the grace of God and now sin has dominion over them. They're miserable. They're bitter. They want to blame everybody but themselves for their situation. It goes on to say, Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Tonight, our next installment on Baptist Distinctives, I want to bring out a thought on sin and abomination. Boy, after all the good singing and good testimonies, we're going to bottom out right now. We're going to talk about sin. What a blessing, huh? Can I say the word sin is one of the most used words in the Bible? Can I say it is one of the least topics preached on from behind most pulpits? Most preachers are afraid to preach on sin. They're afraid folks will get upset uh, and folks will get mad. They'll leave their church. Can I help you with something? Uh, I've never had a preacher preach too hard to me as long as he's preaching in love uh, and he's preaching that book. Uh, and if, hey, I was guilty, I'd hug his neck and say, thank you for preaching the truth to me. Mm. But I want to tell you, folks don't like to hear about sin. Our country right now is divided and in a mess because people don't like to deal with reality. We don't want to hear the truth. Mm -mm. Why? The truth will set you free, but the truth does hurt. Mm. A lot of people think they're entitled because of the color of their skin and what race they are or what uh, gender they decide to be. They think they're entitled. You know what we're entitled for? We're entitled for hell. That's it. The only thing that we deserve. Mm. But the only thing that will deliver us from hell is the blood of Jesus Christ. But until folks hear the truth and their sin is revealed unto them, 
they'll never come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Listen, you don't have to fear about dying and going to hell to get saved. All you need to realize is that you're a sinner and you're guilty, but God will save you. And one of the benefits is you don't have to go to hell once you get saved. What a blessing. But let me just start by saying what is sin? Now, Miss Crystal, I'm not going to name a lot of sin tonight because we don't have time to be here all night. I'm not going to name all your sins. I'm not going to name, you know, murders and thieves and lying and, you know, uh, all the sexual perversions, you know, whoremongers and fleshmongers and all. I'm not going to go into all that. I preach on that all the time. But I'm going to tell you what sin is, and I am going to mention some sin. But I want you to understand what the Bible says about it, okay? First of all, sin can be defined as to err or miss the mark. You know why God gave us the Bible? Show us, show us what the mark is. Brother Bob, where people get in, in, in trouble is they want to compare themselves with somebody else. And you don't have to look very far to find somebody that's in worse shape than you. Well, the problem is the mark is Jesus Christ. We don't want to compare ourselves to Him. Mm -mm. Uh, it means to err, to miss the mark. It means to be guilty. You see, folks don't like this book because they become under condemnation. But thanks be unto God for Romans chapter 8, verse number 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. What a blessing that there is no condemnation in my life now because Jesus forgave me of my sin. My past sin, my present sin, my future sin has all been washed away by the blood of Christ. Uh, and I bless His holy name for that. Uh, what can I say? It means to pervert. A lot of people want to pervert the things of God. They want to make Jesus just to be a mortal man. No, He was the Son of God. He always was God. He is God. He always will be God. They want to pervert His Word. They want to pervert His church. I've said this before, I tend to upset folks, oh well, take two baby aspirins and you'll feel better, huh? Not everything that calls itself a church is a church of Jesus Christ. Hmm? Ephesians 4 says there's one baptism, one faith. Uh, but there's a lot of things out there that ha he, he doesn't have anything to do with. He didn't start it, and he's not blessing it. And so whether well, growing, that don't mean he's involved. Hey, we grow overnight. All I got to do is quit preaching messages like we're going to preach tonight. Hmm? All I got to do is tell everybody uh, every day is a Friday. God loves you just the way you are. Go out and drink, party, and do whatever you want. Just come to church when you feel like it and make sure you always send your tithe in. It'll be wonderful. huh? Folks, come out to that stuff because there's no condemnation. What's the number one thing sinners tell, uh, tell you when they know you're a, ch a goody-two-shoes churchgoer? Don't you judge me. Now, I don't judge anybody. All judgment's been committed under Christ. But this book will judge you. Well, done made some of you mad. I ain't even got to preaching. It means to pervert. It means to make crooked. It means to stray. It means to break away or to rebel against the authority. That's how sin is defined. But let's look at how it's defined biblically. Can I say, biblically, sin is the transgression of the law. You know, there's over 600, I believe 690-something laws that God gave Moses in the Old Testament. Now, we only give him credit for ten, the Ten Commandments. There's no one that's ever breathed God's air that's kept all ten outside of Christ. But there is no one who certainly hasn't kept all 690-something of them. Can I say, under the law, every one of us sitting here tonight in the church house, sitting here coming to worship Jesus, are guilty under the law. Every one of us got blended fabrics on. Under the law, you couldn't. Couldn't have it. There's a lot of things under the law that none of us could have kept. But Jesus Christ fulfilled them all. And then he went and paid our sin debt because we couldn't fulfill them. Hmm? Uh, the transgression of the law makes you guilty. Uh, can I say, it not only means uh, the transgression of the law, biblically sin means to come short of God's glory. We do that every day. Hmm? Means to turn to one's own way. Oh no. Hmm? 
Can I help you something? You wasn't looking for God when you got saved, but He came looking for you. Everyone had turned aside, turned after His own way, turned toward His own desires. Uh, but I'm glad God's desire was to save. He came seeking to save that which was lost, and He came seeking you. What a blessing. Hmm? Can I say it means to do that which is wicked in God's sight? Sin biblically means to do that which is amiss or wrong. It means the lack of righteousness. It means wickedness. And sin in the Bible is called rebellious. It's called froward. It's called unrighteousness. It's called unholy, ungodly, the works of darkness, error, trespass, and offense. All of which we were guilty of. Hmm? And can I say, sin embodied is summarized in 1 John 2, 16. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the uh, flesh, and the pride of life. That's sin embodied. That's sin in a nutshell. Hmm? Can I say, uh, you see it, you lust after it. Your flesh longs for it, you lust after it. Or the pride of life causes you to not submit to the things of God. Selfishness, my right to my claim to myself. Now don't look at me like you're holy, there ain't a halo in the place. There's something you lust after. Mine has four, wheel drive, uh, four wheels and two seats and a, uh, and a convertible top right now, and a six-speed, although I saw one this week, Jordan, a seven-speed. 628 horses. Hmm? Ah, uh, he said, you really lust after them, not as much as I let on, but every time I see a, a, a big tractor trailer pawing them, I pull over and just look at them. And then I say, thank you, Lord, for making something as pretty as that. Huh? Uh, there's something you lust after. Mm -mm. There's something you long for, and there's also something in you that keeps you from totally going all in with the things of God. Listen. Romans, Paul said it this way in Romans 14, 23, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatever is not of faith is sin. And I'm reminded when Jesus was about ready to go in a sin back to the Father, he told his disciples, he said, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? And the days of Noah, man did that which was evil continually. Man was so wicked that God even repented he made man. And Jesus said it would be the same in the days of Noah as the coming of the Son of Man. We see a lot done today in the name of Jesus, but you know what we don't see a lot of? Faith. I still have preachers contact me and say, you all fully open? For a year. Say, well, COVID was really bad in our area. COVID was bad in, in, in everybody's mind that wanted it to be bad. You know what wasn't bad? The flu. Hmm? Can I help you something? There's always a disease that'll kill you. There's always cancer. There's always bronchitis. There's always the Swahili titsi fly something. But I just believe God's big enough to take care of me. Say, well, what if you get COVID? He'll either heal me or take me to heaven. I mean, it's God's will. Nothing can come to me unless it comes through God's hand. Jesus said that I'm in His hand. His hand's in the Father's hand. And no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. Therefore, if it came to me, it had to come through God's hand. And He promised not to put more on me than I can bear. Therefore, He filtered out anything that was not of His will. So if it came to me, it'll be all right because I'm in His hand. I just, I just have been resigned now for quite some time that Jesus is going to take good care of me. In this life or the life to come, it's going to be all right, friend. Uh, so many of so-called God's people sit around and wring their hands. And now they're getting real brave because they've got the vaccine. And that makes a lot of sense. Take a healthy person, give him something to make him sick so he won't get sick. 
Boy, that makes a lot of sense. You say, are you against the vaccine? Help yourself. Huh? Go ahead and do whatever you want to do. I'm just going to live for Jesus. I'm just not afraid of it. It's not controlling my life. Don't act like you got some faith now because you got a needle jabbed in you. I just believe he's big enough to take care of me. You ask her, she's sitting right there. The day she called me and told me I had cancer. Ask her what I told her. I said, it didn't catch God by surprise. It'll be all right. That's what I told her. Mm -mm. Worked out pretty good for me. So why? Because God's in control. He honors faith. Mm, but if it's not a faith, it's sin. If we can uh, figure out every angle and every way that we're going to be able to build a building or every way we're going to start a ministry or every way that everything's going to get taken care of, that's not faith. I remember when we moved into this building, people were asking, Preacher, how are we going to pay for this? I said, well, God's the one to put it all together. He'll pay for it. And, well, I understand that, but how's he going to do it? I just told you. God's going to take care of it. Now we're looking to build another one. I can't believe what, how much they're going to cost. They say it's going to cost. It ain't going to cost that much, but I, how's it going to get done? Well, God's got all the answers. He'll take care of it. I'm not going to fret over it. Huh? Bless God. I'm glad we're not in a tent somewhere worshiping him. Well, he's been pretty good to us. Uh, anything without, if whatsoever's not a faith, it's sin. And so there are a lot of folks come to church every time the doors are open and they're sitting there fretting about everything in the world. You know what you're doing? You're sitting on a church pew dishonoring God. Well, I lost the rest of the crowd on that one. Well, let's, let's, let's look at this. Where did sin come from? By the way, this is a hard one to swallow. There are a lot of hard things in the Bible. But the Bible says that God made everything. He made good and evil. They explain that, preacher. I can't even explain how I got out of bed this morning outside of God. I, don't, I can't explain a lot of stuff that's in the Bible. But where did sin come from? I'm not talking about evil. Where did sin come from? Well, sin originated in Lucifer's pride in eternity past. You'll find that in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14. You'll also find it in 1 Timothy 3, 6. Can I say sin entered the world through Adam's disobedience? And let me just stop right here. God told Adam to keep and dress the garden. Everybody wants to go off on Eve. By the way, ladies, we'll get to this in our study. You're not going to like it. We'll get to it anyway. God's the one who said that the woman's the weaker vessel. I didn't say that. God said that. Adam was to be the head of his household in the garden. Where was Adam when that sorry, no good tempter, Satan, the serpent, showed up tempting Eve? But... Brother Ray, if Adam would have really done what God told him to do, that serpent wouldn't have been in the garden in the first place. He didn't keep and dress the garden because he allowed slew foot in. You give him an inch, he'll take a mile, friend. It's a whole lot easier keeping him out than getting rid of him once he gets in. And then, of course... Satan changed the word of God on Eve, beguiled her. She looked at the fruit, lust of the eyes, uh, saw that it'd make her wise, lust of the flesh, uh, and she took and she ate it. Then Adam did take and eat. This is not in my notes. This is theology according to Brother Doug studying the book. We don't know how long Adam was without Eve. But it's long enough for him to name every plant, every tree, every fish, every bird, every animal. And he looked over all of that, and God saw that he didn't have a help meeting, and none of that would satisfy him. So God put him to sleep, made, uh, took out a rib, made Eve. Now, I know Adam was a lot smarter than us, but it took more than a day or two to name everything. 
to examine everything, to look at a giraffe and call it a giraffe, you know. We'd have called it a long neck, long neck ugly thing, but he called it a giraffe. He, he knew what it was. Adam remembers Brother Charlie life without Eve. Adam knows she's disobeyed God, and God said the day you eat, you're going to die. So Adam can't think about living life without her again. That's why Adam took of the fruit. It wasn't about his love for God, it was about his love for Eve. He didn't think he could live without her. Now I know some of you think you could live without your wife. But that's, a, that's a whole other message. We'll get to that one, all right? Adam's disobedience brought sin into this world. And sin was passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5, 12, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Adam didn't think that thing through. Had Adam and Eve not sinned, they'd still be here in the Garden of Eden. But they sinned. And it was passed upon all of us. Well, how does sin work? Well, let's go back to Psalms 19. In Psalms 19, verses 12 and 13, I find the progression of sin described in these verses. Again, in verse 12, it says, Who can understand his errors? That error is what we would call slip-up. He just slipped up. Can I help you? Every day, if you're not careful, you'll slip up. You can be trying to be careful. You can be trying to do what you're supposed to do. If you're not too careful, you'll slip up. If you step in a mud puddle, that's a slip up. But you don't leave your foot in it. You get it out and get it cleaned off. But if you're not careful, that slip up gets bigger. We see the slip up, the errors. Then notice what it says in verse 12. Cleanse thou me from secret, secret faults. That's hidden. Your slip up, if you're not careful, becomes secret. All of a sudden, you put your foot in the mud pedal, and you thought, you know what, that kind of refreshes that foot. I kind of like it. I just don't want anybody else to know about it. So you try to hide it. Remember Achan? God told him when they went into Jericho not to take any of the cursed things out of Jericho. He took a Babylonian garment and wedged a gold, went and hid it under his tent. Didn't think anybody would find out about it. One man's sin affected the whole nation. You may think it's hidden, but God sees it. You slip up, then you try to be secretive. you got hidden sin. Well, the progression continues. If you don't get it taken care of, if you don't get that slip up taken care of, it'll become a secret sin. If you don't get that thing taken care of, get it under the blood and turn and forsake it, it grows. Look at verse 13. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Presumption means deliberate. That is selfishness. That is when you know something's wrong, you know God's displeased with it, and you don't care, you're going to do it anyway. That is dangerous, friends. It is also selfish when you don't care about anyone else around you. Because the Bible says, no man lives unto himself, no man dieth unto himself. Your sin affects other people around you. It affects your family, may affect your co-workers, may affect your neighbors, may affect your city, may affect your country. You say, how can my sin affect? Well, you get stone cold drunk and get in your car and drive down the road, it may affect a whole other family. Hmm? It's selfish, a presumptuous sin. And then we find that the progression is culminated in subversion. Look what it says in verse 13. Let them not have dominion over me, then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. 
when you deliberately sin because you didn't take care of that slip up and then it became secret now it's deliberate it's selfish and then it becomes subvert subversive you say what are you talking about you become rebellious you live in that thing that thing has dominion over you we call them addictive you say well, I'm not addicted to this thing well then give it up it dominates you it dominates your thought process it dominates your actions and it dominates your spirituality towards God he says that I'd be innocent from the great transgression. What is that great transgression? That's where you become so rebellious you justify your sin and you refuse to repent and forsake it because you think you're okay in it. That is a great transgression. A slip up becomes a great transgression because in every step of the way you don't do business with God and get it taken care of. You don't repent and forsake it. And by the way, repentance is turning from it. Hmm? Repentance is you're going this way and you realize you're wrong and you turn and forsake that way and turn to God. Remorse is where you feel bad about it, but you keep doing it. That's how sin works. How sin dealt with. Well, there must be confrontation. We're confronted with our sin by the Scriptures and by the Spirit of God. Romans 3.23 says, For all sin comes short of the glory of God. You're confronted. You was confronted when you was lost. You're, you're lost. You're a sinner. Somebody shared the Scriptures, and then the Holy Ghost just kind of began working in your heart. You go to sleep at night thinking, I'm not right with God. I'm a sinner. Romans 5, 8, But God commended His love toward us, and that why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. A lot of preachers uh, misquote that. They say God commanded. They didn't mean He commanded His love toward us. He commended His love toward us. He deliberately showed His love toward us, and why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for the good and the holy. There wasn't any. He died for sinners. God gave the just for the unjust. Uh, he that knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We were confronted with the fact we were sinners, uh, but we were confronted with the fact we didn't have to stay that way. Uh, God sent His Son to die for our sins. Uh, I want to tell you something. It breaks your heart when you realize it was your sin that hung Jesus on the cross. Mm. Mm. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death. That's what sin costs, death. But the gift of God, hallelujah, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm glad that God loved the world, but i got news for you. That means you. He loved you. For whosoever will, for whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's confrontation. That's why people come out for singing. They don't like to come out for preaching. There's preaching and there's a little confrontation. Not only does it take confrontation, sin is dealt with through contrition. We call it conviction. Before you got saved, you didn't know what it was. All you knew is uh, 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 you found yourself doing things you didn't normally do. You started uh, crying in the middle of the day. You started worrying about sin. You started thinking about sin all the time. You started thinking about the church house. You started thinking about uh, 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 you need to get right with God. And all the time your minds are working and it just worked on you. It was bringing you to a point where, you was, where God would break you to where you would believe on the Lord. I'll never forget I've told this story. I'm going to tell it again. It's been a long time since I told it. Most of you are getting old and you forgot it anyway. I'll never forget, Miss Lynn, she knows this story well. My granddaddy had a lady that came to church. She lived right next door to the church. She ended up teaching in one of the little Sunday school classes. And, uh, she came to church and her husband's lost. She came to church, Brother Jim, 16 years 
with her husband lost. Uh, then through course of events, uh, they're coming to church and they had to drive to church. And her husband's not only lost, but I mentioned he's the biggest drunk in town. And so he'd drive her to church, drop her off, and then go hang out at the bar till church was over. Well, we got a burden for him. His name was Gary. We started praying for Gary. We got such a burden for him, Brother James, that there'd be times right in the middle of service we'd just stop service and just have prayer for Gary and get a hold of uh, God and grab the horns of the altar and start praying for this old boy to get saved. By the way, had the church got a burden for him about 15 years earlier, he might not have been lost that long. Are you listening? Well, I'll never forget, he brought it to church one Sunday, and he got out of the truck. She said, you going in? He said, no. He came in, he sat down. She said, you going to stay? He said, no. He sat there the whole service. The next Sunday, same thing. Well, after the next Sunday, we was having a revival meeting. Well, he came to revival meeting. Came every night. But Monday night... Uh, uh, we announced that the uh, church had acquired a little piece of ground and we hoped to build a building on it, uh, and, uh, but it, the lot needed to be cleared. Next day, the guy got up, got in his truck, threw an axe in the back of it, went out to that little piece of property and got to cutting down the trees. I mean, there was some saplings, but then there was some pretty good side. He's out there swinging an axe. Uh, came to revival meeting that night, couldn't even shake your hand because of the blisters on his head. Uh, uh, listen, uh, on that next Sunday morning, he did a Pete Rose head first slide uh, into the altar and got gloriously born again. Uh, and his old testimony was, I didn't even know why I was out there on that property, uh, but I ended up out there and I didn't know why I was cutting them trees. I didn't know why I'd come in and sit down in church. Uh, I do. Uh, it's called conviction. Uh, uh, the Holy Ghost was uh, working on him uh, and he got to doing things he'd have never done before. Uh, and I'm glad God in glory uh, knows how to touch our hearts uh, and work in our lives uh, and draw us to an altar of repentance uh, called contrition. Only God knows how to work in your life to draw you to Him. But He knows how to get you. Uh, I got saved when I was 10. I remember on Thursday night asking my mama what my granddaddy meant about being saved. I was in church before my mama was out of the hospital from having me. But I just went to church because that's what we did. But all of a sudden, I started paying attention and the Word started working on my heart. Uh, my mama took the Bible and showed me. Uh, uh, that was on a Thursday night. Uh, back then, we had church on Saturday night too because uh, we was in the country and there wasn't nothing else to do. Uh, we'd go to church on Saturday night. Uh, on that Saturday night, my granddaddy got to preaching, uh, but it wasn't my granddaddy doing the preaching. Uh, there was somebody else stopped and stepped into that sanctuary that night. Uh, hey, uh, that night, uh, he got me. Uh, he dealt with me back there. Uh, third way back in the church uh, that night I met the Lord at the altar uh, my granddaddy said boy are you satisfied uh, I'm still satisfied 47 years later uh, God can do a work in your life uh, uh, can I say mm, sin is dealt with through confrontation but then contrition God works in your heart and your life to draw you to himself. I got a real problem with somebody the first time they ever walk into church, don't even sit down and walk forward and say, I want to join the church. Uh, there's something wrong there. You spend a lot of time in this world, and the world's put a lot in you, and it takes a work of a holy God to get himself in you. Extract a lot of that nonsense you believed on. Uh, and then there's conversion through repentance and faith mm. repenting of your sin and believing on the Lord now this is going to upset a lot of people's apple carts I really don't give a rip 
Brother Jim, I believe somebody gets saved when they say yes to God in their heart. I believe if He's been working on you and massaging you and dealing with you, you come to church uh, all of a sudden that night, uh, or if you're uh, at the job site and somebody's talking to you, or whatever it is, uh, that moment when you take that first step towards God, I believe that's when you get saved. All the formality up here in the altar and taking people through the Bible, all that's to, to help them when the devil shows up and tell them they didn't get it. When they got it, it's when they said yes in the altar or in the pew when they step out. That's when they got it. Now, there's some people who don't fully understand, and they've got to get to the altar, and they've got to ask some questions. They, I understand that, uh, but most people in that first second when that God's been a dealing with them, they say, yes, that's when they got it. It's repentance and faith. They're turning from who they were to Him, and they're believing on Him. That's when it happens. Because salvation is the work of the heart, not the mouth. But if He works in your heart, it'll come out your mouth. Well, the first evidence you get saved, you can't wait to tell somebody else. I got real problems. Somebody says, yeah, I got saved, but I don't want nobody to know about it. You didn't get what I got. Mm. So that's sin. Dad, how am I doing on time? All right? All right. Mark her dad, he said, I'm doing well. I don't believe it. <laughs> By the way, everybody keeps asking, what do you got to get to preacher? What do you got to get to preaching? He just likes to aggravate me. Just leave him alone. Uh, I aggravate him. It's kind of a two-way street. You know, it's been 20 years of love affair of aggravation. All right? But let me give you abomination. Abomination is a whole different topic of sin. If most preachers won't preach on sin, I promise you they're not going to preach on abomination. Hmm. Well, what is abomination? Well, it's something that's hated. Something that's detestable. Something that's disgusting. Something that used to not be talked about in mixed company. And now you see it on the news every night. Well, let me give you a few things about abomination. Under the law, there were two types of abominations. There was ceremonial and moral. Ceremonial abominations were intended to separate Israel from all other nations. And they did it in their sense of worship and in their sense of being a nation. They did it to, in the law that God gave them to separate them from everybody else. Uh, laws like uh, not eating pork and certain meats. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks be to God under grace, we're allowed to eat eat half the, half the hind end of a hog. Hallelujah, what a blessing, huh? Uh, Bill, you like that hog, don't you? Yeah, me too, bro. Look what we'd been missing had Jesus not died for our sins and gave, gave us grace. What a blessing, huh? Uh, there were other things, like they were forbidden, forbidden the worship of idols and anything that was offered to an idol. There was all kinds of ceremonial law. And can I say... Under grace, the ceremonial law was done away with because that facet of worship's been done away with. We don't uh, just, you know, have a Passover feast once a year and slay a lamb and that pushes back the sin. God gave the perfect lamb who took away our sin. And we worship him every Lord's Day celebrating he's not in the grave. Uh, so ceremonial abomination is really uh, is no longer in effect, but moral uh, uh, abominations... Uh, they're still in effect. Uh, moral abominations were things that God hated, and He still hates. Let me give you some of the moral abominations. Abomination. A lot of folks want to sidestep today. Can I say we might as well get her out of the gate first? Homosexuality is an abomination before God. Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13 reveal that it's an abomination. Mankind shall not lay down with mankind as with womankind. God didn't create, you know, Adam and Steve. He created Adam and Eve. Uh, it was intended for God that a home be made up of a man and a woman. That's a marriage in the sight of God. Not homosexuality. Nowhere in the Bible do you find where God sanctions homosexuality. One of the new modern Bibles even tries to make Jesus a, a homosexual because he didn't marry. 
Uh, another one wants to make him a whoremonger. Uh, said him Mary Magdalene had a child. Uh, I just like the Bible. It lets us know he's the darling son of God who sinned not. What a blessing. What can I say? Homosexuality is not accepted of God. Now let me stop right here. A homosexual can be saved if he's not a reprobate. Over there in 1 Corinthians, Paul named a lot of folks. He named some murderers, idolaters, and liars, all that. And he said, uh, and the effeminate uh, homosexual, which were some of you. That's what you were. He said, but you are washed. You've been born again. God can save a homosexual. If God saves a homosexual, they won't stay a homosexual. Hmm? But if a homosexual becomes a reprobate, read Romans chapter 1. Don't have time to give all this out for you. But go read Romans chapter number 1. There comes a point where they'll do those things which are not con convenient, when they'll go against nature. And they'll come to a point where they cross the line and God looks at them as a reprobate si uh, uh, silver and He calls them a reprobate and says they're no more of use and God will never deal with them about their sin anymore and they'll die and go to hell. There's no hope for them. You say, explain the difference, Brother Doug. Well, I really can't because I'm not really big in the homosexual community. Although we had transvestites show up about, you know, eight, ten years ago wanting to come to church... Uh, that's the ugliest man in the world, dressed like a woman. It was a mess. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Let me say this. There are those who are introduced to homosexuality. Just like the devil preys on the minds of the weak, you see it in churches. Weak-minded people, the devil will mess with them. Can I say he'll prey on weak people in, in society, people that maybe don't look like the popular crowd, people that maybe weren't as involved in extracurricular t activities in school, people that maybe aren't uh, uh, the pretty crowd or, or the people that aren't this or that or whatever. Uh, 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 they're not supermodels and they're not, uh, uh, they're kind of uh, 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 loners and folks that think that nobody cares about them. Well, the devil sends somebody to them and start telling them they care about them. Uh, and there are some who are introduced into it or, mm, let's say, uh, lured into it. Uh, I believe, Brother Bob, that's the crowd that can get saved. But those who pursue and those whose conscience are seared and those that have an agenda... Those who want to have the laws changed uh, and they're uh, declared that they were born that way and declared that they deserve civil rights and all. I'm talking about a crowd that doesn't want to hear truth. That's a reprobate crowd right there, okay? Uh, homosexuality is an abomination for God. Occult practices are an abomination for God. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 and 12. You've got a Ouija board in your house, you ain't right with God. You're welcome. Uh, if you've got idols in your house, if you've got little statues of Buddha in your house, you ain't right with God. That's a cult. Uh, if you've got little upside-down uh, rulers made into a triangle with a G in the middle of it, that's a cult. You've got little eastern stars. That's a cult. It's an abomination for God. You'll never have the blessings of God in your life having that stuff in your house. Boy, that got real. Thank you, Phil. Boy, that, got, that went on real good. Huh? I got a whole library on the Masons. It's a cult. Hmm? They say they believe in a higher power. They say they believe in God. Go in there and start mentioning the name of Jesus Christ and see what happens. They got a God. But it's not the God. Hmm. I know free will Baptist churches, missionary churches have, uh, you know, Mason preachers. Hmm. They're part of a cult. And so the people sitting under the preaching. But you're welcome. That didn't cost you anything extra. Huh? Are we all right? We doing okay, Brother Jim? All right, thank you. Can I say? 
All right, somebody lock the door. It's going to get rough, right? Thad, lock the door. It's going to get rough right here. I'm just talking about a bomb down. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I'm giving you a chapter and verse to you. You can read it. The wearing of apparel which pertains to the opposite sex, Deuteronomy 22, 5, is an abomination before God. Well, James, you come in here wearing high heels. After I get done laughing at you, I'm going to tell you, you ain't right with God. Oh, uh, seriously. I, I wouldn't want to be a woman. God bless you women. Plucking eyebrows and painting your faces and shaving your legs and getting pretty. All I got to do is roll out of bed and put a ball cap on and go down the road. What a blessing, eh? What it takes for you to be you, God bless you. You're the last creative act of God. The woman's the most perfect act of God. What a blessing. I, I'm, I'm married to a woman. I love my wife. I'm thankful for her. Uh, she's been a jewel in my life. But I wouldn't want to be in her shoes, if you know what I mean. There ain't no way. You know, get back to homosexual. I've never seen a man that makes me want to just go up and put a big smooch on him either. Tommy, I love you, bro. But I'm not swapping slobbers with you, man. It ain't happening. <laughs> Brother Bob, every time I'm away preaching a meeting, he'll tell Mrs. Nanny, he said, tell, tell Brother Doug I love him, but not in a gay way. <laughs> Tells him that all the time. And I always, you know, give that same sympathy back to him. Uh, see two men holding hands. That's sickening. It really is. Uh, I'm glad I come up in the day and age we dealt with that a whole lot different than you deal with it now but I'm leaving that all alone I'll give some of these little boys an idea huh? let me just say this they were glad to stay in the closet back in my day huh? Whew, sickening you know, all this cross dressing crowd where do they get size 15 pumps anyway huh <laughs> Uh, it's all I can do put socks on can you imagine having to wear pantyhose brother Brian that's messed up I'm serious man it's messed up it's an abomination for God it's going against nature mm. that tells you how seared and sick some people's minds have become and you say brother Doug why do you preach about it? let them love whoever they want to well here's the problem then they start adopting children then they start abusing those children then they make those children be as perverted as they are and so on and so forth it's not natural to paint your hair green but you go down the mall and you see it like crazy you know what they're doing? They're crying out for rebellion. They've been introduced into a society that goes against nature. It's an abomination. God hates it. It's detestable. It's disgusting. I hate it too. It's disgusting. Hmm? Hey, I'm telling you, if you don't got... The, oh, don't God, what, what English that is. What a blessing. If you don't have pure flicks, you ought to get pure flicks. There's no homosexuals. There's no cussing. They're not, they're not even violence. On shows that have violence, they cut away to you. You can't even see it. Huh? You can't watch a sitcom without homosexuals on it. You can't watch a, a, a TV show. It's not going to have homosexuals. And I mean, and, and, and everything else is out there that goes against nature. Mixed races and everything else. And you see it all on there and portrayed as normal. You know what? 75% of America doesn't believe it's normal. But it's being shoved down our throat. You ought to go to places I go. Hey, I go to places, they still fly the rebel flag. They don't believe in all this junk. Huh? Right. By the way, the rebel flag was not a hate flag. It's a victory flag. Huh? St. Andrew's flag. It was, it was flown for a thousand years in Scotland before America even came into... Eh, never mind, I ain't getting into all that. Prostitution is an abomination before God. 
Deuteronomy 23, verses 17 and 18. Uh, this one will cause people to bow their heads. Unjust business practices are an abomination before God. Deuteronomy 24, 13, 16. Hmm? Uh, when you uh, get out and unload your cart and you find something in your cart you didn't pay for, it, you say, oh, well, and you throw it in the car and go on down the road, that's an abomination for God. You was unjust in your business practice. I'll never forget, I was preaching revival somewhere down in Georgia. And I went to Walmart one night and got me some Cokes and some stuff. And, and uh, I got out there and I realized something had slipped down in the cart and I hadn't paid for it. It was a dollar and six cents. A dollar six cents. I went back and had to wait in a long line, went back to the same cashier and said, Ma'am, when I got out the car, I seen I didn't pay for this. I need to pay for this. She rang up and she said, You came all the way back in here for a dollar six? I said, Yes, ma'am. I said, Because I'm a Baptist preacher and I'm preaching revival down here and God won't bless the meeting if I stole that from you. Hmm? Uh, those of you cheating on your taxes, God's a watching. I believe he said, render unto God what's God, and render unto Caesar what's Caesar's. Mm. By the way, cheating on your tithes? Boy, I only had two amens on that. It's an abomination. Mm. You know what that means? If you cheat on your tithes, that's just as hated by God as that homosexual crowd we talked about. And he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah over them. What do you think he'll do to you? He'll not bless your life. He'll not bless your home. He'll not, well, boy, we're meddling now, huh? A divorcee returning to their spouse after being married to another. It's an abomination in the sight of God. Deuteronomy 24, 4. Uh, Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 lists seven things that God hates that are abominable. Pride, lying, shedding innocent blood, wicked imaginations, a false witness, and sowing discord. That person's always causing problems in church. That's an abomination for God. Mm -hmm. The way of the wicked, Proverbs 15, 9, is an abomination. The prayer of the wicked is an abomination to God, Proverbs 28, 9. The thoughts of the wicked is an abomination before God, Proverbs 15, 26. And the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. Proverbs 21, 27. A lot of things God hates. I wonder what Joel does with that on every day's a Friday and God loves everything. No, there's some things God don't love. There's a lot of things God's against. Say, so what's he for? Jesus Christ. And those that have been washed in his blood. Let me, let me just close out with this. God's hatred of these things is based on His holy nature. He's not picking on anybody. God's holy. He created everything perfect, but everything became tainted by sin. And He hates every wicked way. Mm -mm. Uh, anything that diabolically opposes what He intended for it to be, or robs Him of His glory, detest Him. That's why on our church bylaws we, we've, we've got it real clear no practicing homosexual can be a member if somebody presents themselves for membership they have to present themselves in the gender they were born as we got it all covered why because if God hates it we don't want to let it filter into our church and there are a lot of things he is di diabolically opposed uh, that's why I know he's coming soon because this world's spinning so far out of course it's getting to the point of no return if we're going to do anything for God, we better do it now. You better be witnessing to folks, inviting folks to church, giving them tracts, letting them know about Jesus, because sin is real, and abomination is starting to take its hold in America. And can I help you something? No country has ever been given over to sinful and abominable practices that God didn't bring severe judgment on. America's not getting away with killing 60-something million babies, calling it abortion. America's not getting away with embracing that homosexual trans L B G T B B D, you know, all that other letter junk. I don't even know what half of it stands for, don't care. It's not getting away with it. And just in case you don't know, 
Black lives matter. White lives matter. Red lives matter. Yellow lives matter. Uh, Jesus, he died for them all. The only matter that re- the only color that really matters is the royal redeeming red blood of Christ. Because God's no respecter of persons. God help us to realize in this sin cursed world there is a solution. And his name is Jesus. I hope you know him tonight. If you don't, tonight be a good night. Just give your heart and life to him. Maybe you're here tonight. And you've had a slip up. I've got good news. He said if we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Baby night, you, you just really haven't prayed for somebody that's lost like you should and you just got a burden. You need to start praying for them. Night be a good night to start that. Maybe God's dealt with you some other way tonight. Why don't you just come and do business with the Lord? That's what the church is for is reveal truth and then give you an opportunity to get things made right with God or do business with God. So some are already praying. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Let's all stand. While they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. God, we all come short of your glory. Help us, Lord, when we do, to realize it so we can get it taken care of swiftly. Father, I pray. Lord, I know we covered a lot of things and we just shotgunned it out there. But I pray that the sweet Holy Ghost, take our feeble efforts, do a work now. Maybe somebody you've been dealing with about getting saved, I pray tonight they just get saved. Just step out and put their faith in Jesus. Maybe somebody here tonight, Lord, you've been dealing with them about some other matter. They just come, do business with God. It might not even have to do with sin or abomination. Maybe it's just submitting. Maybe it's just surrendering. Maybe it's just getting a little closer to you. God, maybe somebody tonight needs to go to somebody and hug their neck and tell them what they've been a blessing. I don't know, but Father, during this invitation, we pray the Holy Ghost have His way, wouldn't be grieved or quenched. We pray you do a work around here. We pray that you'd be glorified. Bless now, and we'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.